Yeah. But, no, I love it. Yeah, it's a it's got eight gigs of RAM, I think, and it has a 256 gig solid state with a terabyte hard disk. And then I upgraded it to have the NVIDIA graphics card, but it's like a medium range NVIDIA graphics card. Test one two. Test one two. Like, I played League Good the evening, game. everyone. So a lovely. Like, Slightly chilly evening in November here in Tucson, Arizona. We'll take it while we can get it. Um, hopefully, uh, everybody brought a, a jacket or something because it is a little bit nippy. Um, but I, I hope you'll all be comfortable. Uh, there's there's good hot pizza to warm you up. Um, my name is Shepard Reed. I work at the Flandreau Science Center and Planetarium at the University of Arizona. Uh, and welcome to this Science Cafe. If you haven't been here before, our series this fall is the moons of the solar system. And tonight we're excited to learn about the moons of Saturn. Uh, there's a lot of fascinating things to, to discover about the moons of Saturn. Some of the most exciting planetary science uh, going on these days has to do with the moons that orbit other planets in our solar system. But before we get to that, I'm going to give uh, a quick plug for our upcoming holiday shows at Flandreau Science Center and Planetarium. If you haven't come to see us lately, we have uh, a great planetarium theater. It was renovated about a year ago with the Full Dome Digital Projection System. And we have a couple of holiday shows. Uh, we have one called Season of Light. It's all about the different festivals of light uh, across times and cultures that happen around the winter solstice. Uh, including Christmas, and it, and it goes into a holiday laser music show called Laser Holidays, so your favorite holiday songs with laser lights dancing on the dome in the Planetarium Theater. So come check us out for the holidays, bring the extended family, it's a great place to visit. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to our presenter tonight, Bashar Rizik. He's a senior staff scientist at the Lunar and Planetary Lab. Can we have a big round of applause for Dr. system will be known as the, the solar system that hosts the planet Saturn because it's so unusual and so unique. Um, the, inner, uh, the inner Saturn system consists of uh, five icy satellites, five big icy satellites that and they surround the rings. So we're already talking about being outside the rings of Saturn. Um, the, the five satellites, and you can't really read them from your chairs, but I'll call them out. It's Mimas, uh, Enceladus, Tethys, Dione, sorry, Dione and Rhea. So those are all water ice worlds, which is interesting because water ice, as we know, leads to good things life-wise. Um, it's about um, minus uh, 180C minus 300, so you're, you're, you're basically around 90 Kelvin. Uh, uh, not a lot happens at around 90 Kelvin. Uh, the, the chemistry gets very interesting and rather bizarre. When we go out even further to the edge of the system, you'll be out at Phoebe, which is the darkest by far of the Saturn moons. Um, it's completely unlike the others, and people believe it to be a captured satellite, uh, asteroid. Uh, so it's about 8 million miles out. So now you get a sense of how big this system is. 16 miles from one end to the other. So, let's shift gears. Now we're talking about life. Uh, is life possible anywhere in the solar system? That's the question I want to pose in this slide. Other than the Earth, of course. We see a life all around us on this planet. So, it's generally accepted that for life to form, you need uh, a liquid reservoir, or, uh, a liquid medium, you need an energy source of some kind, uh, and you need the raw material to build the bodies of life, you know, the, the, the organisms. Only four other places in the, other than Earth and the solar system have ever been suggested as possibly hosts or places for life, and two of them are in the Saturn system. So uh, they are uh, Enceladus and Titan. Uh, this is a, an image taken by our own high-rise of Mars. The image on the right was taken by... The, the experiment I worked on when I when I graduated, which is the uh, the sent imager spectral radiometer, which was on the Huygens probe, which descended into the atmosphere of Titan and settled to the surface under a parachute. Enceladus is the moon that created has created a big stir in the last decade or so, because in 2005 Cassini took this remarkable image again 
uh, the sun is being blocked or is, is being seen largely in forward scattering so that it, it back, backlights uh, anything dusty around the surface of Enceladus. And what we see coming off the surface are a bunch of geysers. And when people studied those geysers, they found that they were made of water, which means, or implied at the time, that there was a reservoir of water interior to that satellite that was spewing out this stuff. And in fact, that's been confirmed a dozen years later to be an interior ocean. I think people have pretty well accepted, at least in my field, that that is what we're seeing, or that is the implication. The, the fourth place that we're talking about that could possibly harbor life in the solar system is the famous satellite of Jupiter called Europa. And there, it was quite evident when we took these remarkable images uh, from Galileo that there's something uh, really exciting going on on this uh, uh, object because you can't see a crater there. I mean, for us, uh, living, uh, studying the terrestrial, or who were growing up studying the terrestrial planets, the inner planets of the solar system for so long, we, we are used to massively cratered surfaces that have existed for billions of years. You don't see any of that here. This is a very young surface constantly being uh, re replenished. Um, okay, so let's shift gears yet again. Um, what do we know about life from a terrestrial setting? Uh, well, there's a, there's a concept here that I'm going to introduce just because it's interesting and it's current and you guys will run into it again. It's called LUCA, with the last universal common ancestor. So this is a, a, a modern attempt to determine how, what the earliest life in our, on our planet looked like by, by doing a DNA, what is essentially a DNA forensic analysis. So you analyze every species that we know about DNA, which is a massive undertaking, six million uh, different genomes I think you have to look at, and you try to parse them out into their commonality. And what you end up with at the end uh, please forgive me. Okay, sorry. What you end up with at the end is a, 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 a snapshot or, a, or a, a, a window into what such an organism might have looked like. It's, this is what all of us, all living species, and bacteria, uh, animals, plants, everybody, what they have in common. So when you do that, what you find is that this least universal, last universal common ancestor inhabited a, a geo, geochemically active environment uh, rich in H2CO2 and iron. Why is that important? Well, it indicates a thermophilic environment. In other words, it probably originated in an environment like this. This is probably, at least the current thinking in the last couple of years, is where life started. Near uh, a mid-ocean ridge, uh, a black smoker, uh, a, a, a very a hot environment that was coupled to water which is very surprising. There's nothing about the sun in here. In fact, you don't even need the sun, apparently, to, to start life, okay? So um, I, I listed some more uh, information here, but it basically all supports the idea that uh, autotrophic or origin, autotrophic means it, it derived its own energy. You know, it, 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 it went off and, and made its own living as opposed to a heterotrophic organism which has to eat something else to derive the energy, okay? Uh, it, it consumed hydrogen and CO2, and it was in a hydrothermal setting. So that's very interesting because that says that perhaps it's possible for an interior ocean on one of these outer worlds, one of these outer moons, to have started life, supported life. Um, another aspect of terrestrial life that we'd like to, you know, memorize or learn <laughs> as we look outward to the outer solar system to see if there's life there is the idea that as soon as life was able to be supported physically on the surface of the planet Earth, it sprang up. As far as we're able to, to determine, we look back in time, we are able to see the evidence of life, and this is a, an image of uh, an ancient stromatolite, and stromatolites are just um, uh, layered deposits that are made by bacteria when they scoop up sediment as they as the sediment uh, descends in a, in, a, in a liquid environment, and they use it to kind of armor themselves, right? So what you end up with is this kind of rocky formation here, which is still being formed today. These are modern stromatolites. So apparently, they existed as, as, as early as 3.7 billion years ago, which is literally at the tail end of the heavy bombardment period. So you, you're talking about a period where the Earth was being 
for hundreds of millions of years being struck by all manner of objects, and it, it's rendering the surface to a, a, you know, almost a Hadean, you know, hellish state, right? And deep down in these mid-ocean areas, the base of the oceans, you were forming life. I mean, that's the picture that's starting to emerge here. Okay, so now we go out to the outer solar system. Oh, we had to do one more thing. Sorry, before we go back out there, we have to talk about water. Why is water so special? Well, water is a bond between oxygen and two hydrogens, as everyone knows. And when you make that bond, what happens is the, uh, the oxygen draws the electrons from the hydrogen and, and makes them hang out nearer to it rather than to the, uh, to the hydrogens. The hydrogen then becomes, as a result of this, net positive. The oxygen becomes net negative. And this is a measurable thing. I mean, they, they spend most of their time in a negative state or in a positive state. So what you end up with is, a, is a, a molecule that's positive on one side, negative on the other, therefore very polar. It's got a definite voltage or potential that points in a single direction. It's a strong one, right? So what does that mean? Well, it's a very simple thing, but it has profound implications. It's like the statement, water is a polar molecule is equivalent to the statement, humans have opposable thumbs, right? I mean, if you think about that statement, it makes so many things possible. In the same sense, water being polar makes so many things possible. So it results in um, a very high melting and boiling point compared to other comparable compounds similar in the periodic table, very high heat capacity. It's, it's liquid packing is denser than the solid. So when you freeze water, the, the, the frozen part doesn't sink, it floats, which is very important because if you've got an entirely frozen lake or body of water, you'll still have liquid at the bottom, you'll still be able to support life. The very high surface tension of water allows uh, colloids and, um, and, and suspensions to exist for long enough periods that they're able to do you know, wonderful things. Uh, the solid phase has a very interesting uh, behavior uh, if you, you raise it to a high enough pressure and the right temperature, it creates a cage, a cage-like structure that surrounds other molecules whole, just swallows them whole and stores them there, often for hundreds of billions or billions of years, and then releases them. This is the case of, in the north, in the tundra, we have uh, methane clathrate. So we have these methane molecules at the, at the base of some of these continental shelves that have been there for ages, uh, surrounded by these water cages at high pressure, right? Now that with global warming and catastrophic, you know, landslides and, and all the rest, you might be releasing a lot of this methane. So that's something that's very current. So it, the net result is water is seen as, for better or worse, essential to life as we know it. So hold that thought. All right, now let's talk about uh, Saturn's moons. Which of them do you think could harbor life? So the first one, the most obvious one, is Enceladus. Uh, we actually know that it has liquid water in its interior. Uh, so we, we, we listed the three ingredients for life, at least in the simplistic sense, was a liquid medium, a source of energy, and materials with which to build your living organisms. So it, it would satisfy all three of those criteria according to most conventional models of how a body like this formed around a, a primary like Saturn. So we are putting it as a maybe. What about Dione? And we'll get back to what the energy source is in a second. Uh, maybe again. Um, it's been, it, if you look at the surface, right, uh, the, the surface of, and I should have pointed this out on Enceladus. The surface here is, 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 while not exactly like the surface of Europa that we saw before, it's, it's resurfaced, it's evidently resurfaced, and obviously resurfaced. There are very few craters, right? And, excuse me, most of those are probably fairly young. So there's evidence of stuff happening in the, in the surface being refreshed and renewed. It's a similar kind of situation on Dione, uh, maybe not as young a surface, so it's less likely. Tethys, another one of those inner moons, probably not. If you look at it, it doesn't look as resurfaced as the other two. So there's a not, you wouldn't, you wouldn't look at this and this wouldn't be your first choice of where to go to look for life in the interior. And then Mimas is the innermost of these moons. And this one's a real surprise. No, it, this doesn't look anything like what we would expect 
something with an interior ocean and uh, a, a, an evident light living system to look like it looks like the moon or mercury or something that uh, it, it reminds you more of a of an interior terrestrial planet and yet it's the one that probably has the greatest chance of having an interior energy source due to tidal heating which is the mechanism most often invoked to explain why these objects why these satellites are hot enough in the interior to, to melt water Okay, now we get to Titan. So Titan is a, is a tough nut. Uh, for one thing, it's, it's perpetually shaded by a uh, haze, a brownish orangish haze of hydrocarbon particles. Uh, we can't really see to the interior until we sent uh, you know, a giant uh, bus-sized spacecraft called Cassini, which had uh, a, a gorgeous spectrometer, which actually is another U of A instrument. Um, the VIMS, which was able to penetrate the haze in the, the, the one to five micron range of wavelengths and take these remarkable images. And what it found uh, was there are lakes of liquid hydrocarbons everywhere on Titan. And ev evidently, there is a, uh, a, a liquid cycle involving these hydrocarbons. So you have uh, a liquid cycle or a, a, a I, should, I should more correctly call it a liquid vapor solid cycle. So it's, it's what we have here on the Earth with water. Water exists in three phases on the surface of the Earth, and it's constantly moving between one phase or another. Why is that important? Well, because it's an energy, there, there, uh, there's many reasons why it's important, but one of the reasons is that it balances the energy out, right? So it, it's, a, it's a way of buffering the surface conditions, you know, by changing the phase of the, the liquid. So in other words, you can keep things stable on the Earth even if the sun, as it was early in its history, is 30% dimmer, right? Yet there was still life. You know, even if your, 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 your bacteria go crazy and start spewing all this O2 into the atmosphere in, a, in, in unprecedented quantities, right? So there, there's a, something about that physical mechanism that is important to having life, and Titan has it, or has the potential of having it with hydrocarbons, a completely different kind of chemical species. So is this something that could possibly support life? It would be a life we've never been familiar with. Uh, we just don't know the answer to that. One of the problems with this satellite supporting life is that it's very, very cold. Uh, if any of the interior moons had life, they would be supported at about zero C, which is the melting point of water, of course. Here, the, the temperature would be closer to uh, minus 180 C. So that's deemed to be too cold to support certain basic chemical processes that you think you'd need for life. And I think I'm at the end of the presentation, at least the, the nominal one. What we see is that the, the conditions that create life have, and I didn't go into this very much because I wanted to abbreviate the presentation, and if you have questions about it in the Q&A session, I'll be glad to elaborate. But the conditions that, that create life have a lot to do with uh, the, the, the idea of gravitational resonances in the solar system. So you have this almost clockwork-like structure or, 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 or frame to uh, explain the bodies that are still in the solar system. Most of the, stuff, most of the bodies that have previously been in the solar system have actually been ejected from it. So all of the planetesimals that uh, formed the planets are consolidated into the planets. There they came from a, a much larger population that in the process of planetary formation uh, were ejected or went into the sun, were driven into the sun. What remains belongs there because it has figured out how to stay uh, harmonious with the larger bodies that are around it. It's figured out how to stay within the confines of the lanes that have been established by these much more gravitationally intense bodies. So that's what I mean about resonance, okay? Everything that... Sorry. <laughs> everything that we have in the solar system, everything that we see out there now, uh, is in some kind of resonance. And these resonances often uh, are very important to, to determining the conditions, the temperatures, the energetics of what we see on these surfaces. Another aspect that I think I alluded to at the beginning was the fact that the, the, the idea of life is due to this uh, fundamental molecule, water, which is a, a marriage between the most 
prevalent element in the, in the universe, hydrogen, and oxygen, which is also quite abundant for uh, being uh, further down on the periodic table. These, these three species, these two species get together, these three elements get together, and they make something that is, almost has to exist just simply because of the way that the periodic table is set up, but it has profound implications. Then we, we, we reviewed that there are several intriguing possibilities for life on Saturn's moons. We, we suggested Enceladus and Titan, maybe Dione. Um, it, it's a long way to go before we can actually claim that there's life there. At the most, we can claim that the conditions are, are, are possible to support an interior liquid ocean. Titan is, well, it's its own thing. Uh, a big question we don't understand is why is Mimas lifeless when, apparently lifeless, when it's the innermost moon with the largest orbital eccentricity, it's a forced eccentricity, and therefore should be generating the most interior heat, and yet it looks like it's never been resurfaced. So Cassini dove into the planet Saturn uh, uh, a couple of months ago, but this search for life goes on. In fact, uh, NASA has uh, written many reports in the last 10 years and has been uh, uh, almost mandated to try to go to Europa and search for life. So this is a, a, a flow chart almost. <laughs> and you see Europa there at the center of how you would actually look for life if you were, if you were gonna send a probe to one of these bodies, right? So they, tr they, they parse the, the problem out in, in a very NASA-like way, very thoroughly and comprehensively. And, and it's really quite interesting, you know? So they, they, they don't just go and put all their eggs in one basket. They, they try to break the problem up into uh, sort of orthogonal different uh, 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 characteristics. In other words, you don't rely on just one thing because you, that one thing could be fooling you. So w one of the things is to look at the classic morphological indicators of life. Um, another thing is to look at the habitability possibilities in the surface. And then look at the context, the geological context. In other words, uh, is it, has, this, has this surface or has this locale been stable for a long enough period that life could form? So um, with that, I'm going to stop and take questions. Thank you. There's, uh, there's, there's a lot of intriguing information there, and that was a terrific presentation. Thanks so much. So those of you who have been here before know that if you raise your hand, I'll bring you the microphone, and that way when you ask your question, everybody can hear the question that's being asked and understand what uh, is being responded to. And, um, and I, will, I see a first hand going up right here. I will get you to you in the order that I see hands go up. If you have a question that you want to ask, but you don't want to ask it, you're not comfortable asking it on the microphone, you can just tell me and I can ask it for you. So here's the first question. For Titan, there was a bullet point that said there was no O2. I was wondering about the significance of that, because don't you need that for life? Uh, or maybe it was further down. Further down, I'm sorry. It's like the third to the last slide. Yeah. Okay, so um, that's a great question. Uh, I thought it was like right there. Yeah, here it is, right there. That's it. Yeah. So um, there is O2 on Titan, it's just buried, right? And so you're right to point out that it's inaccessible for anything that might be trying to form a living organism on the surface to use. So if there is life, it's a life that we don't understand and we've never experienced. That's why it's so unlikely, right? Because we can't conceive, we don't even know the ground rules, right? I mean, how would that life make its living? You know, we can theorize all we want, but until we have some experiments, you know, and, and some kind of ground, you know, ability to make, uh, to draw some facts or get some facts going, then I don't think that we, so yes, there is O2 on, on Titan. It's, it's like the equivalent of rock on the earth, yeah. All right, we got another one right here. Your last couple of slides, you earlier said that you'd have to find a heat source. Now, on Titan, I can understand if it, it has all the methane floating around there, that it probably could ignite some of it if you wanted to have a heat source. But I don't understand, you didn't mention it, in that little circular thing you had. The little so, so, 
let me take that in a couple pieces, right? So you, the first, to your first point, if we, we can, have the fuel, could you repeat the question? Just oh yeah, the, sure. The microphone got so away. The first question was um, the, the 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 question of a heat source on on Titan. Could it be possible to generate it by igniting the methane? Right? Would, is that a fair statement? So um, you, you don't have an oxidizer because O2 or any similar oxidizer is not. Uh, immediately available to participate in that chemical reaction. It's the opposite problem that you have here on Earth. Here on Earth, we have tons of, of oxygen, right? And all we need is fuel, right? So, you know, forests, uh, you know, are a prime example. So that's why you can't really, you can't really burn things to generate. So what's the heat source? There, the heat source is basically the sun. There's a little bit of a, of a infrared, of a greenhouse that's established by the methane and ethane, but uh, mostly it's just solar insulation. Does Europa have a heat source? Europa's heat source, yes, is the uh, is tidal heating. So the question was, does Europa have a heat source? So I'm going to pull in one of my backup slides. So <laughs> let's start, let's talk about tidal heating just a second. So forgive me, Shepard, but no, I'm just going to go. <laughs> so. Why are tides important? Well, what, what tides are is a change in shape of a, of a smaller body around a larger body and a change in shape of the larger body around, when it's being orbited by a smaller body. So when two objects are that close to each other, they exert a gravitational force on each other, of course. But the gravitational force isn't just toward each other. It's also a squeezing effect that happens to each body, right? And since they have a primary, which is much, much bigger and has a lot more gravity than and a secondary, which one do you think gets squoze the more, <laughs> right? So for, for, for uh, most of these pairs in the solar system, it's a smaller object. It, it gets elongated in the direction of the primary. So eventually what happens is if it's in ex an eccentric orbit, it will uh, circularize that orbit if it can. Uh, it will change the rotation period so that it matches the orbital period. And that, in fact, has happened to most of the close-by satellites to primaries in the solar system. So th this is the resonance I was talking about. This is the first example of a resonance. You've got a resonance between the rotation of a satellite and its orbital period. So for the moon, it rotates once a month. It moves around the Earth once a month. It always presents the same face to the Earth. We never see the backside of the moon. The same thing is true of even to spades of the of the satellites in the, the Jovian and uh, Saturnian systems. Okay, there's a difference though. They are a bunch of satellites, not just one satellite like the moon. There's a bunch of them, right? And they affect each other just like the primary affects them, and they affect the primary. So if they can't circularize their orbit, they're in a state of tension. So I am going to, I think I got down on the next slide. The classic example is the inner satellites of Jupiter. So the innermost one is Io, the second one out is Europa, and after that is Ganymede. Then there's, the, to complete the, the, the quartet of, of Galilean satellites, you'd have Callisto on the outside, but we're not gonna show that. These guys are all in a resonance with each other. So every time Ganymede moves around Jupiter once, Europa is moving around twice, and, and Io is clocking four, road, four orbits, which is interesting. So what that means for them is they want to be in this resonance. If they start moving out of this resonance, if, if someone starts playing his own tune or her own tune, the band leader will come right in and, and force them to stay you know, in B, right? That's just the way that gravitation works, right? You can't, if it's a, if it's a nice, stable energetically stable system, it'll pull itself back and, and be withstand these small perturbations. What does that mean for tidal heating? Well, if the, when, when you're in an eccentric orbit, you're closer to the primary at your periapsis and further away from your primary at your apoapsis. And this causes a change in speed with which you move around the primary. Now, what does that mean? Well, you know how the moon always keeps its face turned toward the Earth. Well, it doesn't do that perfectly because the moon is itself in a slightly eccentric orbit. It librates. Sometimes it's got, it's tilted so that its face is a little bit skewed to the Earth, like we're seeing a little bit, we're showing a little more leg, 
and then sometimes it goes in the other direction, right? So that produces a situation where you have the primary here and the elong shape, elongated shape that way, but it's slightly tilted. So the primary is going to want to squeeze the thing back into an elongated shape, even though instantaneously, but it still happens, right? That creates friction in the interior and that generates heating. That's a very long explanation of how tidal heating comes to happen. It's forced tidal heating and it's a very well studied phenomenon now. So the, the greater your eccentricity, the more the forcing and the more the tidal heat that you'll generate. So if you look at the, 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 the Jovian moons, the Io is subject to the greatest tidal heating and it, it is the most volcan volcanic body in the solar system, right? Europa is next in terms of tidal heating and it's got an interior ocean that could very well harbor life, right? Ganymede is subject to a little bit of tidal heating and it's got a, a more resurfaced surface than Callisto, which is basically not seeing the effect at all. Okay, so that's, that's the Jovian system. That's the classic example. Now we go to Saturn and what we see is Mimas, and I think I have a, actually a table there. Where was it? Oh. I'm sorry, you guys. Oh, there it is. Okay, so this is the orbital eccentricity of the four inner Saturnian moons, right? And you see the Mimas has by far the highest orbital eccentricity and therefore should have the greatest amount of tidal heating. So if any, if any body in the Saturnian system should show the evidence of water spewing out and, and, and resurfacing and all the rest of that stuff, it should be Mimas. Why doesn't it do that? Well, that's a big question. Nobody knows. It's a, it's, it's a mystery. So that was a really long-winded explanation of tidal heating, but I can take more. <laughs> and, and it brings up so many more questions. I got you here, and then I'll get you. Define life in this context. Oh, you can't define life. So many people have, have tried to define life, and, and nobody agrees on the definition. Um, I'm sorry. I, I don't even want to throw my hat into the ring. <laughs> I mean, the, the, okay. So, does the is a virus life then? Is a prion life? You're starting to get the gray area, right? I mean, so someone is. This is the problem. Someone is always going to be able to find a pathological example to whatever beautiful definition you come up with, and and it's annoying. And they're annoying, but, you know, it's just true. So, yeah. Good question. All right. So I seem to remember that during one of Cassini's passes of the plumes on Enceladus that it detected organics. Can you expound on what kind of organics it I, I, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that result. I, I haven't been paying as much attention as I should. That could very well be. I, don't, I couldn't tell you which organics they are. Sorry. All right, we've got another one here. Something for us to research. Get out your phones. <laughs> uh, you talk about hydrocarbon lakes. What is the source of the hydrocarbon? So there is methane and ethane in abundance on Titan. In fact, it's it's all it's there in um, uh, uh, the the Jovian moons. You know, J Jupiter, Saturn, and themselves. If you look at their uh, their beautiful you know storms and the, the reason for the, the many varied colors, you'll find that hydrocarbons are uh, among the many reasons for that. Uh, Titan is a larger moon. It, it it is a larger gravitational body. So it, it in essence, or at least I would guess, picked up more stuff and uh, was allowed to keep more stuff because it was able to attract it to its 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 forming planetary surface than some of the, the, the lighter bodies, the, some of the less massive satellites of Saturn. So that's how I would explain the presence of hydrocarbons on Titan. We've got another one here. Um, I'm wondering if we have any clues at all about what life in a liquid methane environment might be. I mean, do we have any clues from Earth or any theories? No. I don't think so. At least none that I would believe. <laughs> I mean, we. You can theorize. I mean, it's fun to theorize, right? But you're you're as likely to be wildly wrong as you are to nail it. You know, just that way. I mean, look at. We can't even explain why, Mimas doesn't have an interior ocean, and that's a relatively well accepted theory that 
tidal heating should be causing a lot of this heating, right? But it, it, it apparently, in fact, there's even a rule now, right? In Saturn studies called the Mimas rule. So whatever explanation you come up with for how the inner moons look has to apply to Mimas. And if it doesn't, you might as well not bother. Just a brief pause here. There's a lost wallet. Looks like Fernando Rios. Is he here somewhere? Is that you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, you're welcome. And we have another uh, question over here. It's yours. You're welcome. One of these days, they're going to want to send a probe to one of these likely planets. I I would assume that the only effective way to look for life is to burn through the ice down to the liquid water. Well, how are they no, going to do that? No, we have, we have a scheme. Uh, so we're currently involved in... Um, let me see if I've got... Yeah. So the, 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 it's a tripartite kind of <laughs> strategy. You look for evidence of habitability. Okay, or sorry. You look for a biosignature. So what's a biosignature? Well, let me give you an example. Um, uh, it's often said that, uh, that life is chiral. Does that phrase mean anything to you? Chiral, a chirality is the handedness of a molecule, right? So uh, molecules come in two flavors, uh, right-handed and left-handed. They're the exact same structure, except that if you, were, if you looked at them in a mirror, <laughs> so if you held up a mirror to one of them, you'd see the other hand, you know, the other version of it. Well. They act chemically, as far as we can tell, completely the same. Uh, so any difference is, is a random one, right? And most natural mixtures are what's called racemic, you know, where there's, they have equal amounts of left-handed and right-handed uh, members. Life is handed, because when the original processes that started life began, they had to pick. <laughs> A, a, a molecule, right? And this, this is so far back in time that, of course, it's been lost. But what we see is uh, living amino acids have a specific handedness, okay? Living sugars and b building blocks of, of our, our, our tissues and our structures have a handedness. It's called chirality. So if you, if you, you, can, you can detect this because um, light is polarized, and you can, you can de detect which direction it and what, what is, is it going to be polarized in and thereby detect the chirality. So that's called a biosignature. You go there and you look for that and, and if you find it, then that's a clue that what you're dealing with could be caused by life. So we go there and look for stuff like that. Another thing we do is we look that, to make sure that the conditions that we've outlined for life are present. In other words, we measure the temperature, the pressure, stuff about the solution, stuff about the salinity, you know, on and on and on. There's a whole list. So you have, you send experiments to go do that. Then you go and check out the area, the locale. Is it stable? How much radiation does it get? So you, you send instruments to do that. It should be said that on Europa, for example, it, it's often said that you've got a 10 kilometer thick you know, chunk of ice protecting the interior. Well, if you look at the surface, it's evident that we see the ocean every now and then, that it breaks through and spews stuff out, right? So if you go and look for that stuff that's spewed out, will you be able to find the evidence of life there? That's another thing you could do. So it's not as, it's not as hopeless as you might think. You don't necessarily have to go down. See, now that was just, that was perhaps my bias, right? Because I'm part of the whole, you know, NASA group thing thing, right? So, you know, but that's, that's, the, that's the basis on which we are, you know, justifying sending, you know, very expensive stuff out there. To look. For sure. But, you know, that's deemed as such a complicated problem. There's no way we're going to do that with our current technology and our current society, which is, you know, still worrying about things like feeding everybody. All right, here's another one. Yeah, Richard, that was excellent. Um, 
your, one of your slides said that uh, there's, you expect to find more information from uh, doing the analysis of the casino data. data. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. What, what types of information do you expect to still come out of that? Well, I, I, I wish I could tell you I knew. <laughs> Uh, we have a wish list, right? We'd like to understand things like which are, I mean, life is sexy, right? So everybody wants to contribute to, you know, figuring out if stuff like that has happened. But um, there's a whole origin story that we're still trying to spin uh, for how the solar system formed. So I don't know if you're familiar with this uh, concept, but um, about 12 years ago, 15 years ago now, uh, there was a kind of little mini revolution in the in our thinking about how the solar system formed. It's called the Nice model. Has anyone ever heard of it? No, it was it was formulated or first presented by three groups simultaneously at a conference in Nice, France, which is why it's called the Nice model. And basically what it involves is a realization that the gravitational evolution of the solar system depends just as much on the heavy bodies like Jupiter and Saturn. Sorry, I said that backwards depends just as much on the small bodies like the asteroids as it does on the heavy bodies like Jupiter and Saturn. Okay, so when you realize that, what you find, and this is something that was only determined, as far as I can tell, by people actually doing the modeling in a computer, right? So they didn't predict this beforehand. At least, I, I know how things work and I don't think they did. <laughs> so you see your computer spewing out these results and what it shows is the solar system's planets did not start out where they are today. In fact, what people think is that Neptune, which is the fourth one out of the major planets, started out inside of Uranus, and Uranus was further out than Neptune. And both Jupiter and Saturn were further out. You know, and the influence of the small bodies of the solar system, the planetesimals that formed all the planets that later became the asteroids and the comets, that caused the giant planets' its orbits to gradually change over several millions of years until at a certain point Jupiter and Saturn got into a resonance again resonance it's always about resonance and they violently kicked out a lot of asteroids they kicked out a lot of comets that, th that later became comets they rearranged the order of of the outer planets and possibly they kicked out a fifth planet a fifth, fifth giant planet that used to be there okay so that story is crazy, but it explains a ton of stuff that we observe in the solar system today. So when we, when we study data from probes like Cassini, that is the kind of thing that we'd be looking for. We, we try to make predictions about what we would see if this crazy story were true and go see if we can justify it or disprove it. Good question. Fascinating yeah. answer. Here, we've got another one up here. I actually have two unrelated questions, if that's okay. <laughs> sure. Um, so my first one is actually kind of harps on um, uh, a previous question in that I was curious if there were any corollaries to Titan with the theory of the, like, the primordial soup and the anoxic environment that was thought to be the initiator of life here on Earth with the cyanobacteria and all that and, and the fact that we originated in an, in an anoxic environment yeah. um, and if there were any corollaries to Titan with that. If it chemical environment, that's a great question, the chemical environment I think is too different and the temperature environment is too different that there, there isn't an analogy to be drawn there, I don't think you know, we, here we're very close to the sun uh, we have all this thermal energy, Titan doesn't have uh, I don't think an intense internal energy source it's sort of uh, about average for, for body its size, you know so it, it had a lot of residual heat from its formation I'm sure it had a ton of residual energy from a, a radioactive decay. Um, and, and these did the usual things. You know, they, they probably differentiated some of its interior uh, so that you would have, um, um, you know, layers of rock and different kinds of rock. But I don't think they would driven a, driven a plate tectonics, right? So that is, who knows how much that had to do with, you know, the, the story of life. If, if, if the mid-ocean ridge theory is right, then probably a lot, you know? I mean, so you, you kind of, maybe you need plate tectonics to, to form life. So, yeah, so you see where I'm going with all this, right? It's just, it's, it's, it's hard to draw the analogy, which is what I put, why I put, I don't know, on that slide. 
that actually kind of ties into my unrelated second question. Um, so I was actually curious to know more about the geysers that you were able to observe on, oh gosh, I'm going to forget the name. Enceladus? You're, Enceladus, yeah. 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 Um, and then um, whether that's, you know, more heat driven or more pressure driven, and then can we also see these same geyser events on other, on other moons and what, what, what drives them, I guess? That's, my question. that's a great question. I couldn't even begin to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Great question. Darn. <laughs> Here's another question right up front. I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could you elaborate more on orbital eccentricity and what other properties besides the tidal properties you talked about earlier relate to that sort of thing? Have you ever heard of the Milankovitch cycles? No. <laughs> okay, so... The, Milankovitch was a, was a Serbian mathematician back in the 19th century. And he wanted to be famous. <laughs> he wanted to solve some really amazing problem in, uh, uh, in, in science, you know, in physics. So he went around and looked for it, and, and, and what he chose was what causes the ice ages, right? So he, he said, he theorized that the ice ages had something to do with the amount of light that any given surface on the Earth was receiving. And he he explored all of the different reasons why that amount of light would vary during the course of time. So what are the reasons? One of them is eccentricity. So eccentricity allows you to have less light when you're at your periapsis or your uh, you know, perisun or whatever you want to call it, and more light when you're closer to the sun, right? The reason for the seasons? It's, it's, it's the reason for the seasons, but it's not, that's not, eccentricity is not the reasons that seasons are caused, right? The reasons for the seasons is the obliquity, right? Okay, okay. that's another contributor to um, Milankovitch's cycles, right? They called him his cycles because he predicted how the temperature would change with time, and it turned out that the temperature variations that he was predicting exactly matched the ice ages that we observed. So the theory had merit, and is in fact invoked and used a lot today to explain ice ages. We've gone past that now, but the underlying theory of ice ages relies on Milankovitch cycles. So you're, you're talking about changes in orbital eccentricity with time. So this eccentricity doesn't stay the same, it changes. Changes in obliquity with time, you know, so the Earth's tilt moves back and forth, and other similar orbital mechanics, you know, properties. Okay, so yeah, the answer to your question is yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We've got another hand up here. Just, if there's people back there, Raise them high so I can see them. One of them is just a curiosity. Are most of the planets and the moon um, all named by Galileo? And that's why you have Jupiter and Saturn and Mars? Oh, that's a good question. You know, I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I, I have to take a pass on that one. Sorry. Uh, that's a Google one for me. <laughs> uh, one other question. Yeah. You said the thermals. In the oceans now, we have thermals. They actually spew out a lot of sulfur. sulfur. Yeah, yeah. And the sulfur is, is a new life form. It's a sulfur based life form. If you study them, you see what's been growing down there. The worms and everything else that are surround the thermals in the earth. So well, you don't I, have to have an oxygen. I hadn't heard that. So I am going to go and check that out to see if that's true. You give it to Shipper. I, I, I'm, you know, when I hear stuff like that, my, I'm sorry, but my first inclination is to be really skeptical and then go dig it out and then see, you know, but yes, I will look at it. I'll check it out. Sulfur is right, you're right to point out, sulfur is right in line with oxygen in the periodic. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> Looking around, I don't see any other hands yet. So I, I get to ask some questions. Oh, okay. Um, and my first question is, 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 is there a, a like a draft design of a spacecraft that would go to either Enceladus and or Titan? Uh, yes, uh, we're, we're starting with Europa first. Okay. So um, it's, a, it's a JPL mission. JPL has been given the mandate to develop the concept for a Europa life searching mission. Um, the problem with going to Europa is Jupiter's radiation environment. So on any interplanetary mission, you have to worry about, excuse me, high energy particle radiation. So the radiation sources are 
uh, galactic cosmic rays, uh, they're uh, solar wind from the sun. Uh, they damage your equipment, they upset your electronics, and by upset I don't mean that you know you have to go and counsel your electronics. The electronics will be so uh, <laughs> so horrified about what it experienced it will just freeze up and never work again. That's what I mean about upset. So that's just with a normal interplanetary mission. So w when we when we fly we're typically experiencing levels of radiation that would outright kill anybody here in this room, you know, in minutes, right? That's what our equipment has to withstand when it goes out into space. So you have to shield it. You have to test it. You have to make sure that when what stuff goes wrong isn't going to kill the mission. You do all of this on any typical interplanetary mission, or you have to, you know, demonstrate to some very cold-hearted NASA engineers <laughs> that your stuff is going to work. Now take that problem and multiply it by 100, and that's the challenge you have going to Jupiter. Jupiter's magnetic field is so strong that it sucks up or, you know, confines the particles that are being spewed out by Io. Remember that very volcanic moon we talked about? So they get wrapped around the magnetic field lines like charged particles do, and they bathe the inner Jovian system in a, in a field of radiation that is so onerous that if you fly something into that field, typically it'll go belly up within a month or less. So when you go send something to Jupiter, and all the missions we've sent since Galileo, when we first found out the true uh, you know, magnitude of the problem, all the missions we've sent since Galileo have followed these really uh, crazy eccentric orbits that basically spend most of their time out here, and then every now and then they'll dive into the inner Jovian system, do all their science really quickly, and then go back out, and then take a breather, and then do it again, over and over again. That's how the mission profiles for all Jovian systems follow now. Now, if we're going to go send something to look for life on Europa, we're just going to have to hang out down in the, <laughs> in the red zone, in the hot zone, right? So. The first problem you have when you're designing a mission to Europa is the radiation. So JPL has been coming to terms with this problem for years and telling NASA for years that it's too early, uh, we, we can't do this yet, right? But there is a congressman in Texas um, named Culbertson, and he's on the committee that, that funds NASA, and he is fascinated by the idea, and then we this is a, a, a deeply Christian, you know, man. But he's fascinated by the idea that there might be life on Europa. And he has basically mandated NASA to send a mission to Europa. So they've planned a reconnaissance mission, which is called the Europa Clipper, which follows the profile that I was just talking about. And now they're working on a landed mission, you know, which is an entirely separate spacecraft, entirely separate entity. It's going to go there, withstand all the radiation, uh, deploy a system that settles to the surface of Europa and survives there for a few weeks, long enough to try to run the experiments that we hope would tell us whether life is even possible there. So, yeah. Wow. How do they, how do they shield a spacecraft from that It takes mass. Of radiation? The, the most precious of resources in space business is mass. And you have to, you need a lot of it, right? So you spend a lot of your time um, analyzing the material of your spacecraft. You break it all down. You have solid models for all this stuff. Everything's on a computer. You know, it's, it's supposed to be push button, but we all know what that means, really. <laughs> but it's still, it, it's, things are possible now that they never used to be, right? So you can, you can take your solid model of your spacecraft, and you can zap it in the computer with stuff. And you can determine, well, from this direction, I've got enough shielding because of all this other ancillary stuff that has nothing to do with real shielding, but is providing me shielding. But in this direction, I'll need some shielding. So I put spot shielding in that direction. And you, you fill in all the holes. And that's how you do it. You know, so that's for one thing. Then, <laughs> sorry, you asked. <laughs> we're, we're, just, we're just submitting a proposal to NASA for this one mission, so you know, it's, it's still in my head. Then... You've got to design your electronics so that it's robust. So the, the electronics is designed in, in hierarchy, right? 
So the higher members of the hierarchy boss the lower members of the hierarchy. It's like any hierarchy. So sometimes lower members will just freeze up due to radiation. So the bosses have to be able to reboot the lower members on the fly, transparently to you. Just do it. Get it done and bring the thing back up so it can do its job, right? Because you've got five minutes, you know, perhaps, on a, on a descent to the surface, and your camera is part of some hazard detection system that's it's important to making sure that the spacecraft lands in the right place, right? So, yeah, that's another thing. And and I, 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 I won't go too far, but the reason that, that Europa is the priority is... Is that because of the congressman on the committee? Yeah. <laughs> but there's not all that radiation around Enceladus, so the That's spacecraft true, but, that went there would last but, longer. But, but Saturn, you got to understand, Saturn is a 10 AU, Jupiter's a 5 AU, right? And it takes energy to get out of Saturn. Once you're out there, how are you going to power your spacecraft, right? Are you going to fly gi gigantic you know, solar arrays that, that you would need to... to, to, to pick up enough energy from the sun, or are you going to load up your spacecraft with plutonium, like we did on Cassini? So Cassini contained, by, I, as I'm sure half of you know, the ones that are perhaps been around <laughs> longer and remember this, they contained a plutonium power source, you know, radioisotope nuclear thermonuclear generators that provided Cassini with the power it needed out there. That's why it could have such a sleek design. Let's go look at the design of Cassini. Oops. Obishar. Go back. Nah, just go forward. Right there. Okay? If that had been a Zyrus Rex, we would have two giant solar panels on either side. Um, and that's because it, we, we were, were hanging out at 1 AU, you know, where the Earth is, basically. If we weren't out to uh, Jupiter or Saturn, you'd need about 50, <laughs> 20 of those things, right? You know, to, to power it. So it's, it's a, it may not seem like a more technically challenging thing, but at, at a certain point, you've got to deal with that. You've got to deal with the temperature. The temperatures are much colder, you know, like that. All right. Well, that, I, now I know. <laughs> Thank you. And, and any last questions out here? Well, I think we all want to say thanks so much. Oh, what a fascinating presentation. We look forward to the news from Europa. And uh, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. And I wanted to, uh, wanted to remind you all that next month, the last Science Cafe of this series, um, will be, wait, oh, you know what? I'm holding an old. Yeah, December 12th, thank you. And that is going to be the uh, Pluto and its moons. Um, and this is, this is a an, an last season's Science Cafe brochure, so I picked up the wrong brochure because they look similar. So happy Thanksgiving. We hope to see you all next month on December 12th. And... Uh, have a good night.
I know that. 